Hey church family, welcome to week one of Summer at City Hope. We are so glad that you're here today. Yes, now most of you guys know that I'm on summer break until the first weekend of July, just in time for our National Serve Day, which you definitely want to be a part of, all right? But today, we have the special privilege of having one of our overseers bring the message. Pastor Jason Parks pastors an amazing church in Harvest, Alabama, and he's one of our personal overseers. Now, if you've been through the growth track, you know that we have three men in our lives, three pastors in our lives, who they, they have a voice in our lives. They have a vote and they have veto power in our lives. And it's so good to know that we have men, pastors in our lives who are there for us and they walk with us through life. And Pastor Jason is here today to bring the message. And I am honored that he has taken the time out of his busy schedule to be here today. So I know that you're gonna be blessed. So would you do me the honor of standing on your feet, putting your hands together, and let's welcome Pastor Jason Parks. Let's give Jesus all the praise. Let's give Jesus all the praise this morning. You be seated, be seated. Thank you so much. Good morning, City Hope Church. How's everybody doing today? Hey, it is so good to see you. My wife, Jessica, and I have been ministering in Texas this week. I think I have gained 20 pounds off all the barbecue I've eaten. Come on, somebody. Just an incredible week, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you this morning. Before I do anything else, I just want to honor Pastor Ben and Annalise and the Murray family. We all know that Jesus builds his church, but the Murrays had to say yes. Amen. And I'm so grateful for them. And I'm so grateful for you. I want to honor each and every one of you this morning. Whether you were here early praying or in the parking lot or making coffee, you were here preparing. Maybe you're just here. You have invested your Sunday to make a difference in people's life. You gotta understand, City Hope Church, you are making a difference. And the vision that God has placed in your hearts and in the heart of your leadership will come to pass because of faithfulness, amen. And it's been exciting to see all of the life change, all of the miracles, everything that God has already done. But I believe with all my heart that God is just getting started, amen. And he wants to continue to do something special, not only in this church, but through this church, in this city, in this region, in this state, and all throughout the world. Even now, you have a team in Mexico making a difference in the nations. And I believe with all my heart, you are not here by accident. There's a purpose and a plan on your life. There's a place where you can connect, where you can get involved and where you too can make a difference. Friends, let's pray together and let's jump in to God's word this morning. Jesus, we love you, we honor you, and we adore you. We worship you, Jesus. And we thank you for your power and for your presence in this place today. We thank you, God, that we did not bring you here, but you are here, you are working, you are moving. And Father, you have something special for us corporately as a church, but God, through your word that does not return void, you have something for us individually that you want to speak into our hearts and lives today. And so, Father, we are here and we are desperate to hear from you. We are listening, Lord. And God, I ask, may the words that come from my lips this morning come directly from your heart, oh God, so that lives would be changed. We love you, Jesus, and we're going to be careful to give you all the honor and to give you all the glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen and amen. Imagine this, Jesus was teaching in a crowded house. There was a group of religious leaders and experts in the law that were present. The Bible said they had come from far and wide. They had come from villages all over to hear Jesus speak. And people were shoulder to shoulder. They were cheek to cheek. This place was packed. And a group of friends brought a paralyzed man on a mat. And they were hoping, they were desperate. 
Their heart, their desire was that Jesus would heal him. However, instead of immediately healing the man, Jesus surprised everyone in the room by first saying, friend, your sins are forgiven. And this statement shocked the Pharisees. It shocked the religious leaders because they believed only God could forgive sin. And they thought Jesus's word were blasphemous because they did not understand. They did not recognize that Jesus was the son of God. And we read about this story in Luke chapter five, beginning in verse 21. It says, but the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Verse 22 says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So we asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe and they praised God exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the scripture. And every time I have the opportunity, the honor, the privilege of teaching God's word, it is my prayer, it is my desire, it is my hope that I would teach you out of the overflow of what God is doing in my heart and my life. And as I read this passage, one of the things that captivates me is that Jesus not only taught a lot of incredible things, but Jesus asked a lot of incredible questions, didn't he? Jesus had this knack about asking the right question at the right time. And here we see Jesus asking this question, why do you question this in your hearts? And so these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they saw what Jesus had done. They saw how Jesus interacted with the paralyzed man. And they could not understand the question. They they could not understand this statement that your sins are forgiven. And so Jesus asked this question. Why do you ask this question in your heart? And what Jesus is doing here is he is addressing their doubt. He's addressing their doubt. They had not even expressed their doubts out loud, but Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And so he knew their doubts. Friends, we often try to hide our doubts, don't we? We often try to hide things from God, but we must understand this morning, God knows our doubts because he knows our hearts. And so it's best for us to go ahead and acknowledge what's going on inside of us. It's best to acknowledge what's going on in our hearts because we cannot address what we do not acknowledge. In fact, what I've found is I've had the opportunity to minister to people as a pastor. It's typically God will not address what we do not acknowledge. Even though he can He chooses not to address the things that we do not bring to him. And we find in this passage, there were three main reasons that these Pharisees doubted. And they're the same reasons that many of us doubt today. If you're taking notes first, this Messiah wasn't what they had expected. This Messiah wasn't what they had expected. For over a thousand years, God's people longed for the promised Messiah. But when he sat right in front of him, they did not recognize him because he is not what they expected him to be. The Jewish people, the religious leaders, they were looking for a military leader that would rise up and rescue them from the hand of the Romans. And so when Jesus showed up as a baby in a manger, when Jesus became this carpenter, when Jesus served as a humble teacher, they rejected the idea that he could possibly be the one that God had promised. 
Here's what I know, friends. We often find what we are looking for. I see it over and over again. Maybe you have been hurt by church at some point in your life. And so what happens is you go into another church always looking for the negative, waiting to get hurt again. Maybe you have been rejected in relationships in your life, and so you enter new relationships expecting, watching to be rejected again. We find what we are looking for. And the Pharisees had already decided that Jesus was a false teacher. So it didn't really matter what he said. It didn't really matter what came out of Jesus' mouth. Every word he spoke was going to be blasphemy to them. Sometimes we miss the ways God is working in our life because it doesn't look the way we expected it to. And some of you are here this morning and you have been praying for years. There have been things that you have been asking God to do. You've had people interceding for you because you needed God to intervene in an area of your life. And the reality is, friends, God may already be actively answering your prayers, but you don't see it because it's not what you expected. We have to understand that the scriptures say that God's ways are higher than our ways, which means that we don't always understand them. We don't always see it the way God does. And so there are situations and there are circumstances we may come up against in life and we may say, well, God, I wouldn't have done it that way. God, I don't see it the way you do. I told my church just a few weeks ago, one of the most important things we can do as believers is dig into God's word every day. Spend time in God's word. See what God has to say about life. And sometimes there are things in the Bible that I don't understand. Sometimes there are things in the Bible that I don't even like. But here's what I've come to understand. That if I don't like it, it means I'm wrong, not God. We have to understand. We may miss God working because it's not what we expect. The second thing is that his teaching wasn't what they had experienced. His teaching isn't what they had experienced. The Pharisees were experts in legalism. And they believed that their hope could be found in perfectionism and meticulously following every aspect of the law. And Jesus shows up and he's teaching about love and he's teaching about forgiveness and he's teaching about grace and he's teaching about peace. And so when this paralyzed man was presented to Jesus... Most likely, the Pharisees would have thought, they would have believed that his paralysis was a result of his sin or the sin of his parents or his grandparents. That he must have done something, that someone must have sinned against God, and so his paralyzation was actually punishment. So when the first thing Jesus tells the man is that your sins are forgiven, before he had done anything to earn it, it would have been contrary to everything they had believed up until this point. His teaching was unrecognizable to them. And so they doubted. But friends, we also doubt because of our experiences. We doubt because of religious groups, family members, friends that bear Jesus' name but do not model their lives after his actions. We doubt. Because in our experience, Sometimes the situations we face cause us to question, how could a good God allow bad things to happen in our lives? We doubt because situations don't always work out the way we wanted them to. Or maybe we experience 
unanswered prayers. You know, the great theologian Garth Brooks said, (laughs) some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Here's what I know. There's never been a prayer in your life that's been unanswered. Sometimes God answers yes, and sometimes God answers no. Sometimes God answers not yet. God is always working. Even when we can't see what he is doing, he is always active in every part of our life. But the Pharisees, they could not explain the words that were coming out of his mouth. They could not explain his compassion. They could not explain his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. And my concern, my fear is, is there are people all over the world. There may even be people in Wichita Falls, Texas right now, and they have never experienced that God. Maybe because of a church that they grew up in, or a religious figure in their life, All they've experienced is a God that hates them, a God that's mad at them. A a God that looks like something out of Greek mythology, sitting on a mountain with a lightning bolt, ready to strike, playing chess with our lives. But if you want to know what our God is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus. Because he is the personal representation of the invisible God, the scripture says. And he is love. And he is peace. And he is joy. And he is kindness. And he is gentleness. And he is faithful. But third, we see that his actions weren't what they could explain. His actions weren't what they could explain. Jesus forgave the man of his sins and then healed his physical body. And this would have been difficult for the Pharisees to explain. Remember, they lived during a time when miracles like this had not been seen for over 400 years. Remember, when Jesus was born, when Jesus arrived on the scene, God had not spoken to his people for 400 years. There had been no miracles There had been no moves of God. And so Jesus' miraculous actions probably confused them and even frightened them. And friends, we too doubt as a result of things that scare us. Or things that we cannot explain. For some of us, we doubt the supernatural because it does not fit into the laws of science. Let me remind you this morning, we serve a God that wrote the laws of science. Sometimes we doubt because we have difficulty interpreting the Bible. For many of us, we doubt when we have questions that we cannot answer, or we doubt when someone asks us a question, and we have no idea what the answer to it is. But we serve a God that still has power, friends. We serve a God that is still active, intimately aware of what is going on in your heart's and lives today. We serve a God that sees you, a God that knows you, and a God that cares about you. So the question we have to answer this morning then is, what is the opposite of doubt? The opposite of doubt, my friends, is faith. It's faith. A few months ago, I had the honor and privilege of ministering across Costa Rica. We got to take a team and minister in churches and minister on television and minister on radio stations. It was amazing to see what all God had done. And there was this particular church one Tuesday night, we had the opportunity to preach in and pray in and lead worship. And I gotta tell you, the best way I could describe this church is that it had no life. 
It just had no life. The pastor told me before service, I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to stop. I just can't do this anymore. People were there, but they just weren't there. You know what I mean? And so God gave me a word about faith. And in the middle of the message, in the middle of preaching God's word, this man came in the back door holding his toddler son. And you could tell something wasn't right. You could tell that there was something going on and you could tell it was spiritual. As moment he walked in the room, the spirit in the room shifted. And so some of the leaders of the church, they went to the back. I could see what was going on. Nobody in the room knew what was going on. But when you're the one preaching, you can see everything, amen? And I knew something was up. So they took the man and they brought him down to the front row. And the pastor, he had big eyes. So we just stopped. And I said, it's obvious that something's going on. Sir, what's, what's happening? And the pastor said, Pastor Jason, This man is being tormented by demons. And he heard the worship that was playing through the city, through the village. And he wants to be set free. I'm going to tell you, I've had the opportunity to participate in God delivering people many times in my ministry. But they don't teach you about it in seminary, okay? I'm just going to tell you. (laughs) We didn't take no class on that. But just like in Acts in the New Testament, the name of Jesus still has power, friends. And darkness has to flee, and demons have to flee in Jesus' name. And so this man was set free from demonic torment. In front of everybody in the room, they didn't take him to a back room. They didn't take him outside. They said, we're going to do this right here, right now, in the middle of service. And it reminds me of this story because once he was set free, everyone was in awe. It changed everything in the room. The faith grew. The faith grew. And what I have found is that God always meets us at our level of expectation. And when we expect him to move, when we come into rooms like this with faith, When we come into moments alone with him in faith, that's where God meets us. And as the faith grew and the Holy Spirit began to move, there were people that had had pain for years and their pain began to leave. There was a woman in the crowd who was blind and she received her sight right there in Jesus' name because of the faith in the room. You see, this paralyzed man and his friends are a beautiful picture of faith. And in many ways, their actions were the opposite of the Pharisees who had so much doubt. I want to let you in my brain for a minute. Because I don't really read the Bible like everybody else reads the Bible. I like to put myself in the story. I like to imagine it. I like to see it. I'm a visual person. I like to see what was going on. And I just imagine this house that is filled with people. Like going to a concert. You know what I'm talking about? And everybody's shoulder to shoulder, and you're having to push your way through the crowd. 
And it's in the Middle East, so it's hot. So everybody's sweating and everybody's stinky. And they're just crowded in that room. And there's so much expectation. And uh, people wanted to hear from Jesus. They had heard all these stories. And he is here. And people were doing everything possible to get in that house so they could be with him. And he's in there and he's teaching and he's giving all this truth. And all of a sudden, you just got to hear something on the roof. You hear scratching. You hear digging. And I just imagine everybody in the room looking around like, what in the world is going on on the roof of this house? And the digging gets a little bit louder and a little bit louder, and then dust starts to fall. Chunks of dried mud. And who knows what else is mixed in with it. It's falling on people's heads. <coughs> people, <coughs> people are probably starting to cough because of all the dust in the room. And then all of a sudden, you just see this beam of light break through. And that beam of light keeps getting bigger and it keeps big, getting bigger until there's this hole in the roof and everybody's wondering what in the world is going on. And then this guy takes his little elevator on a mat right in the middle, right? <laughs> right in front of Jesus. What is going on? You see, the friends, they sought Jesus. They sought after Jesus. They believed that he could heal their friend. And when they arrived, they continued trying to reach Jesus, even though there were obstacles in their way. They did not let the path, not being what they anticipated, stop them from seeking Jesus wholeheartedly. Amen. And in our walk with God, in this Christian walk, what we tend to do, friends, is we try to drift through life. But let me warn you, let me caution you this morning. You will never drift towards Jesus. You'll only drift away. They sought after him. And it has to be a decision that we make. It has to be an action that we take. Jesus, I'm going to seek you. Jesus, I'm going to be desperate for you. Jesus, you're going to be number one. You're going to be the priority in my life. They sought after Jesus. The second thing they did is they surrendered their need at the feet of Jesus, literally. They surrendered their need at the feet of Jesus. They literally brought their friend and laid him in front of Jesus. And Jesus acknowledged their faith. The life that the paralyzed man had experienced had not been easy. I tell my church all the time, anything is possible, but not everything is easy. The path even to being healed had been difficult. But they trusted Jesus to provide. And for many of you in this room this morning, you are going through a difficult situation. You need wisdom about a direction. There's been an unexpected health diagnosis. There's something going on in your finances. There's something going on in your relationships. But you have been trying to do it on your own, and you are frustrated. You're ready to give up. You're at the end of your rope. And I'm here to tell you today, it is time, friends, to lay it at the feet of Jesus, to come to him in faith and say, Jesus, there is nothing that I can do. I am completely dependent on you. And then finally, we see that the paralyzed man stood at the word of Jesus. When Jesus told the man to stand up, the Bible doesn't say that anything felt different. 
The Bible doesn't say that the man already knew he had been healed. His immediate obedience in standing was an act of faith. And we will not always be able to explain everything about God with our limited understanding, but we can continually take steps of faith and obedience even when we don't understand. And sometimes we have to take that first step in faith in order to grow, in order to experience everything that God has for us. Sometimes we stay paralyzed in our faith because we're still lying down when God told us to stand up. So my question for all of us this morning is simply this. What step of faith do you need to take today? What step of faith do you need to take? It's going to look different for everybody in the room. For some of us, it's as simple as saying, I need to pray every day. I need to spend time with God every day. I need to get in God's word every day. For some of you, it's as simple as, I've been a believer for years, but I'm not a member of a church family. So I'm an orphan and I need to connect somewhere. Can I tell you something? This is a healthy place. You need to connect somewhere. Take the step of faith for some of you. God has been calling you to serve, calling you to be a part of a small group, calling you to fellowship. You need to take a step of faith. For some of you, there is someone in your life that you need to forgive, and you know it. And it's time to take the step of faith and forgive. For some of you, God may be calling you into ministry or a new place of employment. For some of you, it's time to have the faith that anything really is possible with God and that He can intervene in our lives if we'll step back, if we'll let go. There's an old saying that we say, God won't give you more than you can handle. Did you know that is a lie straight out of the pit of hell? God will give you more than you can handle. So you will turn it over to him and let him handle it. And maybe that's the step of faith that you need. Maybe you need to let go of the control that you're trying to have over every aspect of your life. And say, God, I trust you today with my marriage, with my kids, with my finances, with my job, with my calling. Isn't it funny? We will trust Jesus with our eternity, but we don't want to trust him with anything else. I believe, friends, that you can deal with God. I believe you can talk to God. I believe that God wants to talk to you. And I believe you don't need me to do it. And so this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to just meet with God right where you're at. We're not going to embarrass you or call you up front, take you to rooms and ask you questions. We're not going to do that here. But I would just ask everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody's looking around. Let's make this a private moment for people. Maybe you're here today and the step of faith that you need to take is giving your life to Jesus Christ. You see, the same Jesus that did the miraculous, that loved people and taught people, he had a purpose and his 
mission was that we might have life and have it abundantly. And it started with Jesus doing what we could not do. Jesus lived a sinless life. He never said anything, fought anything, or did anything that was wrong. Jesus never sinned. And because of that, he was the perfect lamb of God that could take away the sin of the world. This Jesus lived a perfect life and then he willingly gave up his life to die on a cross. He spilt his blood so that you could be forgiven of your sin and set free from your sin. But understand this, Jesus did not just die for you. Jesus died as you. He took your place. He was your substitute. We should have paid for our own sin. But Jesus died in our place. But here's the good news. The Bible says that he rose again from the grave. And he proved to everyone that he was exactly who he said he was, the son of God in the flesh, the one that could forgive sin. And the Bible is clear right now, he is at the right hand of the father and he is praying for you. That's how much he cares about you. He is praying for you right now. And it is his heart's desire that people would come to a saving faith in him. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's some really good news. Everybody in the room today, you are in anyone. And no matter what your past has been like, you can come to Jesus today. And the Bible says that it is simple. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is a promise. So maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Jason, that's me. I need to place my faith in Jesus. I want to know that I have a home in heaven when I die, but... I want to know that heaven lives in my heart right now. And I don't have to do this life alone. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. If this prayer reflects what God is doing in your heart, I invite everyone. Let's pray it together this morning. God, I've been going my own direction with my life. I've been doing my own thing. And today I realize I'm a sinner separated from you. And I need a Savior. And that Savior is your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. That He died on a cross for me. And He rose again from the grave. So Jesus, I ask you to apply what you did to my life today. Please forgive me of my sins and change me and give me a brand new life today. Jesus, you're my Lord and I'm going to follow you for the rest of my days. And Jesus, it's in your name that I pray. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you're here this morning and You prayed that prayer for the first time. Here's what I want to ask you to do. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm just going to ask you to look up at me. Let me see your eyes because I want to tell you something. So when I say three, just look up at me. One, two, three. I see you. 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 Anybody else? I don't want to pressure you. I just want to invite you. I see you. I just want you to know, friends, I see you. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're changed. You have a brand new life today, a home in heaven. But heaven in your heart. And it is the greatest decision that you could ever make. Can I ask us just to stay in this moment real quickly? 
If you're here today and you'd say, Jason, I need to take a step of faith. Jason, I need a miracle in my life. Jason, I need the divine gift of faith that will help me make it through every situation and circumstance. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if that's you, if, if you say, Jason, would you just pray with me and for me this morning? Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, we love you. We honor you and we adore you. We thank you that your word does not return void. We thank you that there is power in your name. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are still imparting faith into the hearts of people. And so, Father, today, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give divine faith in Jesus' name. And, Father, for those who would say, Jason, I I don't have the faith. There's too much doubt. I can't see a way out. I pray that the faith in this room, that the faith of their friends, that the faith of their family, God, would it move your heart today? Father, I pray for those who need peace. Would you impart peace, O Prince of Peace, in Jesus' name. I pray for those today who need a healing touch from you, O Great Physician. Would you heal bodies today in Jesus' name. I pray for those who need financial provision. Jehovah Jireh, would you provide today in Jesus' name. And for those, God who are bound up by sin, who are bound up by addiction. I declare freedom and broken chains today in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we're going to be careful to give you the honor and you the glory for what you do. In Jesus, it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we celebrate what Jesus did in this place today?